My poems aren't poems if you can't exchange them for groceries. My poems aren't poems if they don't wear bonnets, if the satin doesn't stretch to protect you. My poems aren't poems if they aren't pills, Lexapro, a Sestina hitting the back of my throat. If you know my poems, then you know what makes them poems. Aunties asking for fingers to scrub, my mother's kiss and cuddle. My poems aren't poems if they aren't threats. All my poems are silver daggers. My poems aren't poems if they don't roll in with other poems, the way cousins shuffle in with other cousins, poets shuffle in with other poets. All of our loved ones are poems, stretched over bones, a skin we get used to. My poems aren't poems if you can't live in them, and they wouldn't be poems if you couldn't die in them too. We live in a country that has been studying black women for hundreds of years. White men and women have taken their pens to illustrate the calculations of our skulls, have given us cartoon faces, and tried our dialect for their televised humor. We are America's punchline. Our anger makes great jokes, and it rationalizes fear. In a world that has been writing about us for so long, poetry is a way for us to write the diagrams of ourselves. Poetry is really a black woman's dynasty. In poetry, a black woman lives. It's really a method of diagnosis. In a world that refuses to recognize our sorrows, poetry arrives as a prescription. I started writing poetry when I was 15, and I was really depressed. And I needed a way to articulate the way that I was feeling. But I wasn't that happy about writing poetry. I didn't understand how it could be a black woman's armor. I was taught poetry as a white man's landscape. We all know Frost's Road, Poe's obsession with heartbeats, Whitman's obscenity, which I'm kind of a fan of. But I needed somebody who I could immediately recognize myself in. And it wasn't until I got a little older that I realized that I was standing in a lineage of tons of black women who had been writing for me and about me. Now, I couldn't talk about poetry if I didn't talk about Miss Gwendolyn Brooks. Now, Gwendolyn Brooks once instructed poets, write what's under your nose. And in saying this, she was speaking to a kind of poetry that took the mundane and put it on a pedestal. Not all poems can be about flowers, y'all. And not all poets have the privilege or the time to be talking about flowers. Brooks understood that there are poems in train cars. There were poems in front lawns. There were poems in microwaves and tea kettles. There's so much value about black domestic life being made visible and being celebrated and being investigated by black people themselves. Now, another poet I want to talk to you guys about is Margaret Burroughs. Margaret Burroughs, in her artist statement, talks about being one of the people who made the DuSable Museum possible. And in talking about that, she talks about how everybody on that team, they were all ordinary folks. And she uses that terminology, ordinary folks. And I love that language. I love how both Burroughs and Brooks have an obligation to the ordinary and feel like they need to take the ordinary and paint it as something that is worth being painted. In her poem, Homage to Black Madonna, Burroughs attempts to write black women as the icons that they've never been considered. She paints black women as something being worth painting. There's a stanza in that poem that really sticks out to me when she says, gentle black women, while being hated, yet teaching love, being scorned, yet teaching respect, being humiliated and teaching compassion. Now sit with that. The last poet I want to talk to you guys about, but not the last poet y'all are going to talk about, right? Because you're going to go home and Google poetry, right? Is Eve Ewing. And I have to talk about Eve if I'm going to talk about poetry, because Eve represents not just the passing down of poetry from generation to generation and in decades and different types of lineages, but also teaching and engaging with students about poetry. If we want to do the work to affirm young black girls, if we want to do the work to validate their emotions and show that their emotions can be complex, ultimately, black women are going to have to do that work to black, other black women and black girls. Because the world is not considering us 
in the same way that we can consider ourselves. Eve has a poem called, Why You Cannot Touch My Hair. I love this poem. There's a specific line that I always return to when she says, My hair is a technology from the future, and it will singe your fingertips. (laughs) Be careful. My hair doesn't care about what you want. (laughs) Passing poetry down means passing visibility down. That poem, Why You Cannot Touch My Hair, would be so valuable in a black classroom, in a classroom with all black kids, because so many of those classrooms exist. If a black student could engage with a poem like that, if they could engage with that visibility, they're ultimately engaging with themselves and figuring out how they can be complex and create borders and write about their hair. It's important to note that Margaret Burroughs was a CPS teacher. Eve taught in CPS. The conversation of poetry is an ongoing one. All of the poets that I mentioned to you guys today have a lineage that they can turn to. They have stories they remember from when they're growing up. They have artists that they saw themselves in. We need to continue this family tree of poetry, this lineage that I am a part of and that so many other poets are a part of. It took me so long to understand that I wasn't even the first person in my family who was a poet. I wasn't the first Jackson with a pen and an idea. So I'm going to end this talk with a poem about my family called First. The women in my family have bones in the right places, bridges on their cheeks, structures of caution where the fat might get in. I am the daughter with the round face. The women in my family have noses like compasses, each sniff a sharp indication of home. Carrie is old now, but a young woman sits in her face like a bug trapped between glass. Then Bernie, who walks like a Cherokee rose by never walking. Deborah's bones, firm in their residence, face permanent as a coffin. The women in my family are so beautiful, they don't have to use their bodies. They get two bags of flour for the price of their jaws, scam grandpa out of the last of his taxi money. My mother's face is a disco whistle that moves my father for catfish, for pine nuts, for the remote. I am the first ugly woman spun out of this blood. Where is my asking chin? What will they make of my age? Is there a young woman sitting in me who's ready to make orders? If my daughter writes poems, will she make a flower out of me? Thank you.